Georgia Tech team at six and five bowl eligible for the first time since 2018. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Sean McDonald along with Greg McElroy. Delighted to have you with us. Greg, we really have to marvel now at what this Georgia football program is doing, trying for the third straight regular season to go undefeated, 44 and one in their last 45 games. Tremendous. It's unbelievable. And the amount of turnover that they've experienced. I mean, losing all those guys off the 21 team and then losing all the guys off the 22 team on offense, including their quarterback, Stetson Bennett. But Carson Beck has filled that void at quarterback admirably. He's about as efficient as you'll find in all of college football. He might be without some key weapons tonight. With more on that down on the field, we welcome in Molly McGrath. Well, Sean, Georgia head coach Kirby Smart told us that their tight end Brock Bowers was questionable to play with lingering soreness in his surgically repaired left ankle. And Bowers came out during pregame warmups. He moved well, but I just got word from Georgia's staff that Bowers is out for this game. So is their right guard Tate Rathledge and their wide receivers Lad McConkey and Rob. makes sense Georgia Tech's been one of the worst defensive teams against the run this season but they're much improved this year and Haynes King is job one for the dog defense tonight and he's an explosive runner track star speed ran track in high school at a high level in the state of Texas he's among the most explosive runners at the quarterback position in the sport he has 24 carries of 10 plus yards that's fourth behind Jalen Milrow Castellanos from Boston College and Jaden Daniels who's a Heisman front runner at this point he is dynamic with his legs but he's got to hit some big throws downfield against a great Georgia defense Georgia Tech won the toss and elected to take the ball first so Jared Circle will kick off for the Bulldogs ordinarily it's a touchback 53 touchbacks at 84 kickoffs and that one will be a touchback as well. Christian Leary elected not to bring it back. So here comes Haynes King. Officially a red shirt sophomore after three seasons at Texas A&M where he was in and out as their starting quarterback. He's from Longview, Texas, the son of a coach. And it's been feast or famine. When he's good, he's great, but the interceptions are not only leading the ACC, they're tied for the lead in FBS football. And he's been outstanding in three of the last four games. However, that one game where he was, it was against Clemson. Four picks and four sacks in what was a performance he'd love to forget. They're a team that runs the ball very well. Here's Jamal Haynes, the converted wide receiver in his first year as a running back, and he got four. Haynes is also going to be very important to this Yellow Jacket offense. He has great open field speed, and the perimeter runs have at times been a problem for the Bulldogs. They'll try to get him on the edge. They spread the field. Georgia defensive coaches told us a lot of times when they do this, it's to spread people out and have King on a design run. This one is a throw. Has a man open, and it's caught. There's a flag down right as the catch was made by Eric Singleton. The true freshman with Malachi Starks there for Georgia. It's an ACC officiating crew. That's the Georgia Tech Conference in this non-conference game. Tim Hedgepeth, the referee. So that wipes out a 31-yard play. So you see Singleton, tight rope inside the right foot down out of bounds right at around the 46 yard line he was not forced out if he's forced out then you can come back in establish your presence in bounds and make a play but he was not he went out of bounds on his own accord which led to the illegal touching and a big play wiped off the board for the jackets brent key 45 year old play alabama native like kirby smart head coach at his alma mater they actually played against each other in this rivalry in the late 90s key was an offensive lineman for George O'Leary and Kirby smart a defensive back for college football Hall of Famer Jim Donna third down and six for the Jackets for Singleton again and it's too long with Tyke Smith in coverage So the decision to take the ball first doesn't pay off for Brent Key as it's a quick punt. A minute and three into the game. And they had a couple opportunities too. Singleton is great 
downfield speed. He's going to be a challenge for the Georgia defense, but Haynes King's got to be able to drop it in there if he gets a step on the defender. David Shanahan, the putter, junior from Ireland. And Mackay Muse back forward. Short and wobbly kick that takes a good bounce. Would have taken a bigger bounce, but it hit one of the jackets at the 35-yard line, hit the backside of Chad Alexander. So here comes Carson Beck. He waited three years to get his opportunity in his fourth season in Athens. Junior from Jacksonville, Florida, out of Mandarin High School where he won a state championship. That 73% completion percentage, if he can maintain it, will be the single season school record by far. Stetson Bennett set it last year at 68.3. That's sixth best in the country. He's averaging 302 passing yards per game. Number eight in the country. He's the only quarterback in the country to pass for at least 250 in every game. Dejon Edwards. The ball comes out, and right now, no whistle. Kenan Johnson has it for Georgia Tech. Jackets can do on defense is take the ball away. Very opportunistic group, as you can see. Edwards trying to drive forward. Eford, Kyle Eford, the player of the game last week for the Jackets, gets her hand on it. Looks as if that ball is dislodged. And a huge, huge play there for the Jackets defense. So Edwards fumbled. Kyle Eford popped it out. They are going to review it, but it clearly looked like it was a fumble. He was still up as the ball was coming out. They're trying to pull off the big upset. Well, after review, the ruling on the field of a fumble was confirmed as Daquan Douse and Kyle Eford met Dejon Edwards right there at the big pile, and the ball pops out. A huge break for Georgia Tech. They've had their struggles on defense, but they do take the ball away. Came in with 21 takeaways, tied for 10th most in the country. And they're throwing a wide open receiver. Brett Scyther, the former Georgia Bulldog, still fighting for every inch against his former team. And they're going to rule them stopped at the nine yard line. But you know, he and a couple of Georgia transfers are fired up to play their old team tonight. And a great design by Buster Faulkner. Seether has great speed. He's the more athletic of the linebackers. He wraps around and gets on the seam. It's a perfectly placed ball off the RPO, and it leads to a big play. Just the seventh catch of the year for Scyther. It was primarily a backup behind some excellent tight ends at Georgia, including the Mackey Award winner Brock Bowers. Jamal Haynes on first and goal from the nine after the 28-yard pass play taken down by Warren Brinson. The loss of one. Brinson back in action, banged up last week. And didn't see action in their victory at Tennessee. Convincing 38-10 win in Knoxville for Georgia playing its best football here in the second half of the season. King settles for the flat and out of bounds with nothing goes Malik Rutherford. The gain of a yard. Well, one thing that's better tonight for Georgia, they didn't give up a touchdown on defense on the opponent's first offensive possession as they had done in each of the last five games, which is crazy considering how good they are in defense. And especially how they responded last week. 75 yards and a touchdown on the opening play from scrimmage and just 200 yards the rest of the way. The only other team to give up a touchdown five straight games in the SEC on an opening drive was Vanderbilt. A couple of years ago, that's in the last 20 seasons. They fake the reverse. Haynes King, the touchdown. You know, the 
Georgia coach has said we can't let Haynes King beat us with his legs. He was untouched. Nine yards and a, another early deficit for the Dogs. And the extra point good by Aiden Burr. The eighth rushing touchdown of the season for King. And Malik Rutherford on the jet sweep gets the fake. And then Scaglione, the right guard, he pulls around on the quarterback power. King cuts back for another big play. The quarterback run game in the red zone is one of the things that Kirby Smart and Glenn Schumann, the defensive coordinator, are most concerned about. And the open field speed of Haynes King on display there for the first score of the game. So Georgia trails early again. In fact, Kirby Smart joked that he said to Glenn Schumann recently, maybe we should just let them score first and get it over with. So no panic in the Bulldogs. They've been here a lot this season, particularly of late. With the kind of start you need if you're a big underdog, trying to pull off an upset in a rivalry game. Gavin Stewart kicks off. 40 touchbacks and 57 kickoffs. This one is heading toward the sideline and played by Muse right along the boundary and he's dropped immediately. Well covered by Luke Benson, the Georgia Tech tight end, six yards on the return. All season long, student sections across the country are competing to be the Taco Bell Lip Moss student section of the year. Download the Taco Bell app. To learn more, Georgia Tech students have not cheered a home victory against Georgia since 1999. The dogs have won the last 11 meetings here. They've won 18 of the last 21 overall. And there are plenty of Georgia fans here. As a matter of fact, there's more red and black. As you look around the stands, and that's not unusual when they come here to Atlanta, about 70 miles from Athens. Dominic Lovett runs out of bounds with a 12-yard gain and a first down. Yeah, there are Georgia fans literally everywhere you look around this historic stadium. It's amazing just how packed this place was early on, too, with Georgia fans. They were loud in the pregame. Kendall Milton through this leaky Georgia Tech run defense which gives up 222 yards per game on the ground. Only Louisiana Tech and North Texas have been worse against the run. That one went for 14. They're already out to the 43. Georgia Tech a little undersized at linebacker, too, so you'd anticipate a heavy lift from Kendall Milton at 225 pounds at running back throughout the course of the game. Beck over the middle and seven more on the completion to love it transfer from Missouri it's a pay to big day for love it in the absence of Vlad McConkey and Ra Ra Thomas and Brock Bowers as well three of their top pass catchers out so love it's gonna have to step up and talk to Mike Bowe the OC they expected they'd get a game changer with love it but it hasn't really materialized maybe the night's the night he really wakes up and breaks out. So productive at Missouri at 82 catches the last two years for the Tigers. Another quality run. This one from Kendall Milton. 11 yards and another first down. Kyle Eford made the tackle. He became a starter midseason. Off 11 tackles last week against Syracuse, a career high. A great job on the right side of the offensive line, too. Amarius Mim, so good to see him back in the lineup. Future first round pick, big physically imposing right tackle, and they'll run behind him against an undersized Georgia Tech defense, especially on the edges. Milton slipped a bit as he cut and still got inside the 35, stopped by Taquan Douse, who was officially credited with the forced fumble on the takeaway that set up the Jackets touchdown. Already, this has been a great response 
the Georgia offense. And Kirby Smart's really described his team as a resilient bunch all season long. They've taken a lot of punches, especially early. But in the second and third quarter, they seem to get better as the game goes along. And this has been a nice response after the opening turnover. The run game has been sporadic, but you would think they'd be able to run the ball effectively tonight. Beck on target, as is so often the case, to Dylan Bell. Another member, Greg, of that wide receiver core who's come on lately and has been used some at running back. He threw a touchdown pass last week on a trick play. So versatile, too. Third down and one. They line up quickly. They use the size of Beck for the first down. He got hit behind the line of scrimmage. But move forward to move the chains. He's every bit of 6'4", 220 pounds. Waited three years on the bench. He said, I knew when my time came that if I waited, we would have a great chance to win, given the state of the program. He was right. They described, hey, two years at Georgia is better than four at just about anywhere else. So he waited his turn, got very comfortable. Kirby Smart, did it. he was ready to play years ago. Just waited his turn. Now he's playing at a crazy high level, just 12 starts into his career. And they said if he had to play in recent years, he, they were not afraid. That has a ricochet and an interception. Off the ricochet, it's LaMiles Brooks with the second takeaway in the opening half of this first quarter. And a 17-yard return for the junior from Jacksonville. Low throw. And it skipped off. Is presented by Capital One. What's in your wallet? And in part by Boost Infinite. Get unlimited wireless and the latest iPhone every year. While we were away, Rusty Acre in the replay booth deemed that this pass hit the ground, kind of short hopped into the foot of Dominic Lovett. You can see clearly it did. So no interception. No second takeaway of the night for the Georgia Tech defense. It'll be second and 10 for Georgia at the 29 yard line of Georgia Tech. Midway through the opening quarter, Carson Beck, three out of four passing for 24 yards. Here comes a Jackets blitz, well picked up by Edwards. A man is open, it's Lovett with the touchdown. They blitzed and did not get there, and Lovett has the score, his third of the season. Excellent protection by Edwards. Eford's coming at 100 miles an hour. Completely stoned, which allows Carson Beck a clean pocket to throw the slot fade to Lovett, a route that he made so many plays on at Missouri, and they just haven't had the opportunities to hit those here in the first 11 games of the year, but they hit one there. Excellent protection, excellent throw, and a big response from the Bulldogs. Peyton Woodring, the true freshman kicker, has had a tremendous year. Last one through. Well, you said they could use a big night from Lovett without McConkey, and it certainly looked like Bowers isn't going to play with the last shot we saw of him on the sideline. Just a thing of beauty. The slot fade is something that Missouri ran over and over and over again. It's so difficult to defend as K.J. Wallace is out there. He has outside leverage, but there's so much room that he has to cover. And when thrown with great timing, it's almost impossible to defend. So he drops it right in the bucket. And a perfect throw from Carson Beck, bouncing back from that errant one a moment ago that was nearly intercepted. Beck's 22nd touchdown pass of the season. Starting to get some recognition as a Heisman Trophy contender. And Kirby Smart said he was kind of hurt by the team that he plays on because he doesn't play in a style where they fling the ball all over the place. And a lot of times they get a lead. They're conservative with the football. And he is a tremendous talent. Here's Zirkle to kick off again. 
for Christian Leary, who lets it go. Friday night at 8 p.m. on ABC, the Pac-12 championship game presented by Dr. Pepper. Live from Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas. It's been looking all year like this would be the matchup, and it is. Number six, Oregon. Number four, Washington. The only defeat by either one of them. Oregon's lost to Washington and Seattle earlier this season. 19 straight wins for UW after their victory in the Apple Cup today against Washington State. They struggled in that game. Uh, it was back and forth, and a really bold call at the end by Caleb DeBoer to get him the win. On first down for Georgia Tech, Dante Smith, the fifth-year senior. He got seven. You'd have to think that game Friday night in the Pac-12 championship game in Las Vegas, the winner will be into the college football playoff, I would think. No doubt. If it's Washington, there's absolutely no doubt. I think Oregon would go, too. And Oregon was put at six even before their resume really warranted a ranking in the top six, but the eye test has been so impressive. So, yes, they win. They're in. A couple of Heisman Trophy candidates and the two quarterbacks there, Bo Nix and Michael Penix Jr. Fake to Smith, a little dump off to Luke Benson. He ran over Kamari Lasseter at the end of that. Seven yards on the completion of Benson, his eighth catch of the year, transfer from Eligible Syracuse University, the Harvard of Central New York. <laughs> For a rousing win today in the Dome against Wake Forest. Universally considered Harvard of Central New York. Without question. We would not be able to say it on national TV. <laughs> We're not true. <laughs> now the pistol. Haynes King faked the handoff. And has another man open. It's Singleton again out of bounds in Georgia territory. 15-yard gain. Loving right now what I'm seeing from Buster Faulkner, the offensive coordinator. The plan's been excellent. Quick, decisive throws for Haynes King. A lot of misdirection. They've utilized his legs a little bit too, especially when they got in the red zone on the previous possession. He's got his quarterback in a nice rhythm, and the run game has been pretty decent so far as well. King four for five for 51. Buster Faulkner, the offensive coordinator, spent the last three years as a quality control assistant at Georgia. A lot of familiarity on these coaching staffs on both sides. Haynes stacked up. Crowd thought a little extracurricular. Smile Munden leading the way for Georgia, their second leading tackler. There's Faulkner on the left. And he has brought with him a lot of the principles that George has used on offense to great effect in recent years under Todd Munkin and now Mike Bobo. Yeah, very similar in the way they do things with the exception of utilizing quarterback run. That's something they absolutely have to do knowing Haynes King's skill set, but their formations and identities very comparable based on the experience he had at Georgia. On second and ten, King flushed, sets, Singleton, a nice catch. And a first down for Georgia Tech at the Georgia 29-yard line. And great movement in the pocket by Haynes King. Munden unblocked. He's rushing. Haynes King escapes to his left but keeps his eyes downfield. And a great job by Singleton escaping upfield, creating a little separation and reeling it in. That was a tremendous play by the quarterback. It was highly recruited out of Longview, Texas, Longview High School, where he played for his dad, a very successful coach, John King. Here's uh, Haynes King again. Georgia Tech coaches say you can tell he's the son of a coach, grew up around football, very cerebral, has a great understanding of concepts. His dad here tonight with his mom, Jody, very athletic family. His mom is a PE teacher in Longview, Texas, after coaching the softball team for a while. And he grew up in a locker room. He said, I basically lived at the facility with both parents as coaches at Longview High, and it didn't take him long to win this locker room here in Atlanta. 98% of the team voted him as a team captain. It's pretty remarkable in your first year. Again, they fake the jet sweep action. He shows that talent. He's 6'3", 204, and he can move. He got a first down with a nine-yard pickup. And an 
just another little counter action. This time they pull the tight end, Benson, in there as well, alongside the left guard, Joe Fusel. And King surges forward for another nice game. Eighth play of the drive. Georgia Tech trying to take its second lead of this opening quarter. Dante Smith got inside the 15-yard line as we go down to two and a half minutes. An impressive note about Haynes King. He's one of only two players in the country with 2,500 or more pass yards, 600 rush yards, 25 passing touchdowns, and seven rushing touchdowns. And now eight with a score tonight. The other one is LSU's Jaden Daniels, who a lot of people think has a great chance to win the Heisman Trophy. Into the traffic and down three yards short of the first down. Tristan Miller made the tackle for University of Georgia. Third and short situation. The last time down here in the third and medium, third and seven or eight, they went with a quarterback counter, and Georgia had no answer as Haynes King went untouched to the end zone. You'd imagine Red Key's going to be very aggressive tonight, so might have two downs to get it here. So I anticipate quarterback run here on the 10-yard line. Toss to Dante Smith, and he's dragged down short of the first down by Smile Munden, the inside linebacker, and uh, very close to the first down, and they are going to go for it. A little bit like a speed option where Haynes King holds it for just a half second and does a quick pitch. Very close there by Munden. Looked like he grabbed the back of the jersey, but it was a good effort by him as he made the tackle short of the line to gain. Well, after looking like they were going to go for it, he sends the field goal team out. I'm really surprised by this. I don't agree with this. Field no. goals are not going to beat Georgia. No. And you've got crowd into it even a lot of early momentum here and for a guy who's a former offensive lineman you think he put it on his offensive line that's done very well 25 yard field goal for Burr he's made his last 10 Georgia Tech leads 10 Dr. Pepper fans, Bill Studio update. Florida State, number five in the rankings, in some trouble. Just seconds ago, Tate Rodemaker taken down by the Gators defense. Put your hands together. That's his safety. Florida up 12 0 against the Knowles. Back to you, Sean. That game will be watched with great interest. The Seminoles playing without Jordan Travis as the starting quarterback for the first time this year. 10-7 lead. It's a pooch kickoff and a fair catch made by Dylan Bell. You're watching Rivalry Week presented by the Mazda CX-90. This rivalry dates back to 1893. These two head coaches played in it. They overlapped a little bit in the late 90s. Each went 3-1 and one against their rivals as players. 1-1 one and one head to head. It was Georgia Tech winning in 1998 with Brent Key as a starting offensive guard. Georgia won in 1997 with Kirby Smart in the defensive backfield. Brent Key started 44 straight games at guard for Joe, George O'Leary, his mentor, back in the late 90s. Here's Beck on the run and throws it away. And that's, I think, what makes the decision to kick the field goal more surprising. He must have used Brent Key the word toughness and physicality when he talked about the kind of program he wants to build uh, at least a dozen times when we chatted the other day. You, know, you have a chance to kind of set a physical tone there and you kick the field goal. Yeah, I mean, playing like you referenced with George O'Leary, that maybe the toughest coach of all time. And I think that was a big mistake there by Brent Key. Hopefully he doesn't come back to bite him. But, man, you've got to score touchdowns to beat the Bulldogs. Georgia team fifth in the country in scoring offense. Uh, better than 40 points per game.
Chanelius Tatum dropped Dejon Edwards for a loss of one. Uh, what might be the last play of this first quarter, although George is scurrying the lineup. And Beck is not going to snap it. Georgia Tech, the edge in play in the first quarter. ESPN's presentation of college football on ABC will return after this. That's the game plan we have right now. We're sticking to the plan. All right, we're trusting what our plan is. We challenge the players, the coaches. We're all sticking to the plan. All right, it doesn't matter how you're doing. It's all about the next play. It's about the overall game plan. All right, thank you, Coach. Yeah. I think you can question the plan. If you know, they're not going to go for it on fourth and short and kick field goals, that's the plan. It's not likely to be successful against the two-time defending national champs. It's working so far, though. Back, there's a busted coverage on third down and 11. Dejan Edwards, a long run across midfield. They're actually going to spot him right out of the 50-yard line. So on third and 11, they get 26. Strange to have a bust in coverage coming out of a timeout, too, between the quarters. They completely bust. There's nobody in man coverage on Dejon Edwards. It's man coverage everywhere else. The outside corner gets dragged inside on in-breaking ground. Edwards takes it for a big game. Georgia best in the country this year on third down. 56.9% coming in. And two for two tonight, and now through a big hole, Kendall Milton. To the 31-yard line of the Jackets, Clayton Powell Lee, the stop of defensive back. And just a great run here by Milton. He sees the left side, Michael Morris, the left guard, get his man inside. He cuts right off his backside, breaks it to the left for another nice game. Saw Oscar Delp, the tight end, coming across the formation. He resets to the left end of the line. You'll see the bulk of the action at tight end tonight without Brock Bowers. Milton again spinning ahead inside the 25. The Georgia Tech defense coordinated by Kevin Shearer, who coached for Kirby Smart at Georgia. Coached the outside linebackers when Kirby first got to Athens. It was a holdover from Mark Rickstaff. Here's Dylan Bell dragged down by Clayton Powell Lee, who saved the touchdown at the three yard line. 22 yards for Georgia. And how about the block by Marius Mims, right tackle, just absolutely destroying one of the safeties for Georgia Tech. Led to a nice gain. Watch the right tackle, number 65. He's engaged with Jalen King and just sends him for a ride. And a great touchdown saving tackle there on the back by Clayton Powell Lee. First and goal for Georgia. The Bulldogs try to take their first lead of the night. Kendall Milton, touchdown. The three-yard rush is ninth touchdown of the season for the senior from Fresno, California. And the right side of the offensive line just completely buries the Georgia Tech defensive line. If you look at just how much movement they're getting against Daquan Dallas and Zeke Biggers, a couple of their bigger interior defenders, and they take them for a ride. Milton goes right off the backside for a nice touchdown. And then 26 yards rushing on that drive. The extra point good for Peyton Woodring, despite the fact that he slipped down. So at 12.40 to go. In the first half, Georgia leads Georgia Tech by back at Bobby Dodd Stadium in the great city of Atlanta. Time for the AFLAC trivia question. We want to know when was the last time Georgia Tech defeated Georgia here? I know this because well, I was listening to you earlier. Which is unusual. <laughs> which you were is very, something that very said, strange. But I, I have said it already. <laughs> I didn't know that was going to be the Affleck trivia question. You might have saved that little nugget. <laughs> but maybe if you've been watching the football all day, sitting in your favorite chair, you know, your retention isn't as good as it might be. Sure. It's time to answer the Affleck trivia question. Go ahead. Uh, let's go 1999. You are correct. 
And that was a wild overtime win. It was tied at 48 with uh, 13 seconds to go in the game. Bulldogs had the ball at the Jackets two yard line, but fumbled. First overtime, Quincy Carter threw an interception. And then they went it on the field goal. In overtime, did Georgia Tech. 11 straight losses to Georgia here since then. Six yard gain for Jamal Haynes on first down. The Yellow Jackets trailing for the first time tonight now. They had the ball for more than 10 minutes in the first quarter. They have to be encouraged by how they're moving the football on the ground, too. I mean, Georgia so stout against the run, so athletic, so big in the interior. But, man, they're giving up some good yardage on the edge. Haynes again. Fought hard to get within a yard of the first down. Warren Brinson, the tackle for Georgia. Tackle made by Warren Brinson. Georgia Tech lined up quickly and stuffed was Jamal Hayes by Warren Brinson again in the middle of that defensive line. So now it's fourth down on their own 34 and they're going to go for this fourth down and one. Wow. That success outside the tackles. I would try to go there. I mean, up the middle, it's been tough sledding. Yeah, King's been their best bet keeping the ball. It's a play fake. Looked like he wanted to launch a long pass on fourth and one instead of Singleton on the comeback at the 41, and they convert. Seven-yard gain on fourth down and one. And a great job by Singleton, too. He sees his quarterback's in trouble, and he gets friendly. Comes all the way back and secures it right on the sideline for the conversion. That was an excellent job by the freshman. Dale and Everett had the coverage. Well, it's rivalry week. It's a rivalry game, obviously. And you see some interesting things. We have seen several already. Dante Smith trying to turn the corner. He keeps the legs driving and got up to the 48-yard line. Seven yards on first down. This is going to be where Georgia Tech has to live. Their quarterback, Haynes King, he's going to be the guy that will gash Georgia up the middle. But their running backs are going to have to live on the edges, live on the perimeter, see if they can't get flow by the linebackers. But the Georgia Bulldogs, who are very aggressive and are very athletic, Get those guys moving sideways and then you go downhill because it's a matchup nightmare for this Georgia Tech offensive line against these defensive tackles. Jordan Hall, Zion Logue, Nazir Stackhouse, Walt Howard, they're so good in the middle. Smith. Tough run to the Georgia 40. 12 more. Chaz Cham was the stop. And an excellent job here by the center and the left guard. That's Fusel and Weston Franklin who get good movement and displace that defensive tackle where Smith goes right behind him for another nice gain on the stretch zone. You mentioned how much Brent Key talked about toughness in our meeting. Here's some trickery, and it's King who winds up keeping it. Nifty play drawn by Buster Faulkner. They lined up Dante Smith as a Wildcat quarterback. He handed it off. And King uh, faked it, and I think that was a design run all the way, don't you? Well, they had some guys taken off, but there's nobody there. And outside of Singleton, who runs 10-2 in the 100, there's nobody wearing a white jersey tonight that's as fast or as explosive as Haynes King. So a good decision to take off and get what you can get. Jordan Hall, backup defensive lineman, is the injured player. And as they tend to him, a chance for Georgia to catch its breath on defense they're on their heels 12 yard run there for King this has been something that has been problematic for Georgia really all season long it started in the Auburn game where Peyton Thorne made a bunch of plays with his legs and then it carried over into the Missouri game where Schrader the Missouri running back was able to hit stretch zone after stretch zone after stretch zone just really pounding the edges of that defensive line and they've had some struggles as Glenn Schumann is lighting in 
to his defense very frustrated with how they're kind of attacking the outside of perimeter run game. 33 year old defensive coordinator Kirby Smart obviously very actively involved you see Will Muschamp in the background former head coach at South Carolina and Florida who's the code defensive coordinator it's a lot of resources <laughs> that's a pretty good one two punch right there. Schumann certainly a future head coach taking the route comparable to that of his head coach and Kirby Smart He's in a great spot said yes. Someday maybe that opportunity will present itself, but he thinks he has the best defensive coordinator job in America, and it's hard to argue with him. So he's going to wait for the right one, and we'll see if that comes to comes open at some point in the future. Well, let's see if the injury slows down the Jackets' momentum. Dante Smith, boy, he's a tough runner, just 5'11", 100 and. 98 pounds out of Spring Hill, Tennessee. This is his senior night, last home game at Bobby Dodd Stadium. He has six carries now for 35 yards. Yeah, their backs are excellent. Both Jamal Hayes, who's that converted wide receiver with great top end speed, but a little bit smaller. And Smith, a little bit more physical at nearly 200 pounds. And both have showcased big play potential. Smith had almost 200 yards against North Carolina a few weeks ago. They average almost 200 yards per game rushing. They're in the top 20 in the country. Jamal Haynes up the middle. Two yards short of the first down. It'll be third and two. And really all the numbers on offense much improved under Buster Faulkner. We asked Kirby Smart, he at all worried that the offense coordinator on the other side was with you the last three years. He said, no, not really. You know, in this day and age, everybody knows a lot about everybody else. But what a job Faulkner has done. They're the most improved team in FBS in points per game. 31.9 this year, up by almost 15. And fifth biggest improvement in total yards per game. 435 this year. You can do the math. Or maybe you can't. Malik Rutherford has the first down and got clubbed. There is a flag down. Z got taken down at the 11. Flag behind the play. Raylan Wilson, a true freshman linebacker. Abdul Janah, a backup wide receiver, transfer from Duquesne, called for a very costly penalty. And really completely unnecessary. I mean, he's engaged there with Everett on the outside and just holds on way too long. Excuse me, that's Tyke Smith who he's engaged with. It's just Rutherford's running at full speed. There's no way Tyke Smith can make that tackle. You have to let go and let your receiver get that first down. Well, Janah didn't like it as you saw. If you look at the replay. It looked to be a hold, so the first down is wiped out, and now it's third down and nine with seven minutes to go in the first half. They are in field goal range for Aiden Burr. Haynes and Smith in the backfield together. And trouble. It looked like King was trying to pull it back and keep it and got tangled up with Jamal Haynes. And now the field goal team will come out. Yeah, he tried to pull this ball at the last minute, but that's very difficult. Once the ball gets outside the hip of the quarterback, the running back anticipates that ball being given. Haynes tries to pull it late. It hits the deck. Fortunate that he was able to recover to give his team a chance at a field goal. A 45-yarder from Aiden Burr, who's 12 out of 13 this season. As a freshman, yeah, that's a knuckle ball that goes through. Georgia Tech hanging right in there with the number one team in the country. You're watching ESPN Saturday Night Football on ABC, presented by Catball Hall of Fame. Georgia trying to make history by winning a 29th straight game. In their last two drives, they scored two touchdowns after they turned it over on their first offensive play of the night. Georgia Tech with its second long field goal drive. They've held the ball for more than six and a half minutes on each of those two drives that resulted in three points. Makai Muse with another kickoff right along the sideline. 
He went charging right up the boundary and a nice return out to the 36 yard line. Here's Kevin Nagandi. Sean, time now for our AT&T countdown to the CFP National Championship and Blue Florida State. They're down 12 nothing, showing some life here. No doubt. I love this throw by Rodemaker. The first throw of the night that he ripped in there. A nice shot to Bell. And then Trey Benson going in and they're on the board right now at the half on ESPN. It's Florida with a 12-7 lead. Sean, Greg, Molly, back to you. All right, Kevin, one of the offices absolutely have to have, and they need to beat Louisville, too, in the championship game next week, Greg, if they're going to be in the CFP. I don't think they're going to take a one-loss Florida State team without Jordan Travis. No, not, not under their own accord. Carson Beck wanted to fling it deep. He pulled it down. Now he takes off, and he ran out of bounds at the 41, perhaps the 42. Tonight's college football playoff rankings brought to you by Capital One. Matter of fact, last week, after the injury to Travis, Florida State was dropped from four to five, although Boo Corrigan, the chairman, said it really had more to do with the way Washington played last week, a win at Oregon State. Ohio State lost to Michigan. Michigan will certainly be in the college football playoff if the Wolverines can take care of business in the Big Ten title game against Iowa. Kendall Milton for a first down. Kyle Eford made the tackle, seven yards on the play. Every time you watch Milton running against these linebackers, he seems to be falling forward. I mean, all season long when he's been healthy, it really hasn't been much. Really just the last couple weeks, he's getting stronger and stronger and stronger, but he's one of the best in the SEC in all of college football. After you know, four yards after contact per carry, but he's a load when he's getting downhill. Seven for 63, averaging nine per carry. He came into tonight averaging six yards per carry. Part of an effective tandem at running back with Dejon Edwards. Here comes a Georgia Tech blitz. Milton got away and was tripped up just shy of the 45-yard line of Georgia Tech. And just internal pressure here. By Kevin Sure, the defensive coordinator, but this lateral agility there by Milton, who's able to slide to the right and get some yardage was impressive. Milton again. Edwards, their leading ball carrier, watching from the sideline. He had the early fumble. He's carried only twice in the game. Milton with nine rushes now. And he remains the running back. Huge hole. Off he goes. They will not get him. Touchdown. There is a flag back at the 30-yard line. And they're bringing it back. A 36-yard touchdown is going to be wiped out, it seems. Xavier Truss, who's played guard and tackle. He's moved inside to guard tonight with the return of Amarius Mims. He goes right up and engages with Eford, but as Eford tries to break back to the inside, Truss and his left arm is holding that shoulder. And the umpire makes the call, even though he gets hit a moment later. Just a big mistake there by Truss, who's filled in admirably this year in the absence of Amarius Mims. Mammoth senior from West Warwick, Rhode Island, out of Bishop Hendrickon High School. He's 6'7", 320. The blitz, they lofted it over the head of the blitzer. And Edwards out of bounds. Kyle Eford there again. He looks like he would have played in this rivalry back when Kirby Smart and Brent Key played with him. <laughs> you gotta love neck equipment. <laughs> you gotta love the cowboy collar, man. I mean, he is a throwback. Not very big. He's gonna grow into his body. Only 215 or so pounds, but he plays with great intensity and has great understanding of leverage, and he's gonna be a good one in time for Brent Key and the Jackets. George already up to 201 yards of total offense with Three minutes to go in the half, leading 14 to 13.
Beck, plenty of time, throws. Dylan Bell was open, they couldn't complete it. Rare miss there from Carson Beck. That's two now that have been really off the mark, uncatchable. He has been absolutely ridiculously accurate the last couple weeks, so uncharacteristic misses on a couple throws already tonight. Playing without Brock Bowers, who did warm up, but was clearly gimpy. He recovers from ankle surgery. He played their last two games after missing two. But Kirby Smart told us last night he's really been much more sore this past week than he had been after those previous couple of games. Here's Edwards running for the first down on third and nine. Good block by Bauer stand in Oscar Delp. Oscar Delp's really a guy that is not a great blocker at this stage of his career. But Mike Bobo, the offensive quarter, says, man, he really works out. He's one of our strongest guys pound for pound. That time, he does a great job against LaMiles Brooks and springs Edwards for a nice game. And a blitz from deep doesn't impact Beck at all. And there is Delp. More of a receiver than he is a blocker. That's his 20th catch of the year. He was a terrific lacrosse player in high school. Thought that might be a sport in college. His dad played at Rutgers. Lacrosse. First and goal after the 16-yard play. And to me, Greg, I, if I were Brent Key, I would be thinking about timeouts here. Especially. You need every possession you can get. You move the ball. Yeah, I think 100%. I think at this point, you got to start thinking about it, especially after this next down at the very least. Give your offense a chance, especially knowing, too, that, that Georgia will get the ball coming out in the second half, and they have a chance here to take it all the way down and go two for one, potentially. Yep. No sign of it. Edwards remains the running back on the right hip of Beck. And Edwards lunges for the goal line. Touchdown! Just a great run there by Edwards. It looked initially like he was going to be stopped by Clayton Powell Lee at the progressive pylon cam shows that he runs right through the attempt of Powell Lee, extends with nothing that touches the ground and breaks the line to gain. Just a terrific run there by Edwards, bouncing back from the early fumble. His 11th rushing touchdown of the season. And here's Woodring. For his third extra point. He's now scored 114 points. And movement before the snap. That is the Georgia freshman scoring record. Previously held by Blair Walsh, kicked in the NFL. Walsh had 95 points back in 2008. Officials discussing what the flag will be after the movement. Ball start. Offense number 13. Five-yard penalty. It's still the try down. George had a lot of really good kickers over the years. Think of our friend Kevin Butler's here tonight, part of the <laughs> Georgia radio pregame and postgame show. Well, I believe is still the only kicker in the College Football Hall of Fame. Really? Mm -hmm. That is pretty remarkable. I'm shocked by that. Heard he's and I might be wrong. <laughs> I know if at least a couple of years ago that was the case. I'll buy it. Better golfer than kicker, though, correct? Yeah, excellent golfer. Not as good as his son, Drew, the great Ray Guy award-winning punter at Georgia. Extra point is good. Edwards the touchdown. 1.14 to go in the half. The countdown crew on ESPN and the app, all the early breaking stories, injury updates, previews of each game right up to the kickoff. Then Monday Night Football, Caps Week 12 at 8 p.m. A great rivalry. The Chicago Bears and the Minnesota Vikings, Peyton Eli, the Manning cast on ESPN2. Vikings have won five in a row.
against the Bears. They're six and five for the year. Rallied after a slow start. Well, they lost to Denver last week. That's when they really need with an eye toward the playoffs. Zirkel's kickoff is another touchback. 1.14 to go still in the second quarter. Haynes King and the Jackets on offense after this. The college football playoff semifinals. In some trouble right now in the swamp. Alabama survives. Washington survives. Little chaos. Meanwhile, Michigan is smiling. No doubt that Michigan was a more physical team against Ohio State. And Sharon Moore outcoached Ryan Day, which is one of the more surprising things we saw all day. Highlights plus reaction coming your way, Sean. Back to you. All right, Kevin. It has been a wild day of college football. And first down, Jamal Haynes stopped after a five-yard gain. Down to a minute to go in the half. Georgia Tech at its own 30. Well, it's not great field position, but they need to be aggressive. I mean, their defense is really struggling so far against Georgia, and they get the ball in the second half. They need to go try to steal some points. Haynes. Out of bounds, and there is a flag. Looked like it might be a face mask on Malachi Starks. The officials are talking about it, I think. Uh, the official, well, let's see. His head definitely snapped back, but was it a face mask? Doesn't look like a face mask to me. It looks like that hand is up above Personal the face foul. mask. Face mask. Defense number 24. Yeah, close call. I mean, live, his head snapped around on that replay. It just kind of looked like he grabbed him by the forehead. That's what it looked like. I didn't feel like he grabbed any part of the face mask, just kind of hit the helmet. Looked like there at the end, maybe, if you're looking at it closely, maybe the pinky goes into the face mask a bit. Didn't look like much there. I'm surprised they called that. We'll get the opinion of Matt Austin in a moment. It's a big call. Gets them to the 48-yard line. But only 41 seconds left in the half. Haynes King is six out of seven passing. He's their leading rusher. Here's Jamal Haynes. First down to the 32-yard line. An 11-yard gain, and now they'll use their first timeout. And you think of how much time they wasted. Well, they didn't use a timeout on defense, and they started the operation very slowly on this possession. Haynes King's been terrific here in the first half of the football game, and the plan for Buster Falker has been excellent as well. RPO to start things off. He hits Scyther as those linebackers get greedy. They come up. Scyther goes right behind him. He hits him in stride. The misdirection continued. Fake the stretch zone to the left. You boot Haynes King back out to the right, and he hits Singleton, who's crossing field on the over route. And then to finish things up, more misdirection. Shows the jet sweep to the left. QB inside Haynes King untouched into the end zone he's been off to a terrific start and he's a reason why Georgia Tech has a chance here at the end to close the gap against the Bulldogs given time and a one-handed grab by Malik Rutherford and then he couldn't hang on he did he yes he did the ball came out after he hit the ground and it is an eight-yard gain Perhaps seven. Did he catch it? Yes, he did, even with Javon Bullard right on him. So they use another timeout. They're at the 30 yard line with 29 seconds to go and one timeout. And there's no question that this is a much better Georgia Tech team than Georgia has faced in recent years. Man, they are really playing at a pretty high level with the exception of the fourth down decision by Brent Key where they decide to kick the field goal instead of go for it. That would be the one thing I'd kind of disagree with what's gone on. And then they had a chance a moment ago, had the drive stall because of a penalty, the hold by Jana. They've been able to move the football and have had a couple of self-inflicted mistakes that have taken some points off the board. Well, we're seeing the biggest reason for the improvement, the quarterback, Haynes King, who's throwing toward the end zone and is incomplete, looking for the former wide receiver, now running back, Jamal Haynes. Smile Munden had the primary coverage. Tried to work a slot fade, very similar 
to the route that was thrown by Carson Beck a little earlier for the touchdown. That time throws inside and didn't really give the receiver much of a chance to make a play. They're one out of six on third down. They are in field goal range. They've already kicked two of them. They anticipate pressure here from George to see if they can't knock him out of field goal range with a sack. On third and three, that's going to be very close. C.J. Allen, the true freshman, made the tackle. Got his first career start a couple of weeks ago. Jamon Dumas Johnson injured and out of action. They got the first down, according to the officials, so they spike it. And now 15 seconds remaining. They do have the one timeout left. You want to save that timeout if you can for the kicker in the event in which you get sacked or tackled and bounced short of the line to gain. Kirby Smart's on, on the one. field. There's no timeout here. It was a spike. Yeah, I think he thought it was a timeout. He ran back quickly as his get back coach was yelling at him at the top of his lungs. King seems to be having trouble telling what the play is on his wristband. They still have time to get it off. Ten seconds, but some confusion it seems on the offense. They're lined up now. And now Georgia wants a timeout. Or maybe Kirby's just trying to catch his breath after the sprint to the middle of the field. <laughs> He's pretty fortunate there, too. I mean, usually you come that far onto the field, you can get flagged for unsportsmanlike. Fortunate they didn't call that. I guess he was able to get off in time. Kirby Smart, just 47 years old, already two national championships back to back and going for a three-peat, something that has not been done since the Minnesota Golden Gophers did it in the mid-1930s. His winning percentage through 100 career games was best in SEC history, 85 and 15, and he has added seven more wins since. Just terrific and has built a remarkable program that even the departures they've had the last couple of years hasn't dropped off at all. Play fake by King. He can't take a sack. He does. They'll have to use the timeout. Miller dropped him back at the 32. And Miller engaged with the right tackle, Jordan Williams. He pushes Jordan Williams off its side, and Haynes King runs right into the pressure. You just can't do that if you're Haynes King. You have to know the circumstances. That essentially extinguishes any chance at a touchdown. Because now you've had to call your last time out. Might be able to heave one to the end zone, but... Miller's first career sack. Well, if you do run another play, it's risky. Very. He needs to wind up in the end zone, out of bounds or incomplete, where the half's going to end. Yeah, you absolutely have to get the ball out of your hands, too. A sack here obviously extinguishes a chance of stealing points. You have to get the ball out. Burr's long is 48, and now George is going to use another timeout. And he is obviously very actively involved in the administration of the defense. So what do you do if you're Georgia Tech? I mean, you have to be very careful. You don't want to give away the chance for the field goal. Bird has a long enough leg, big enough leg to kick one from here and be about 49. Try to run a little scissors concept where the slot is going to run a corner route and the outside receiver is going to run a post. You read that safety to the right-hand side. In this particular case, it'd be Malachi Stark. So I'd look at something like this and see if you can't get out of bounds potentially. And they throw it to the end zone, caught by Singleton out of bounds. It was a really good throw there by Haynes King. He's able to squeeze in there just nope. a little bit 
too far outside and even as he, as he goes to the ground singleton it looks like that ball might have even button bobbled just a hair but it's a small window he had to fit it into and let the settle for three so now Aiden Burr redshirt freshman who missed all of last season with a knee injury suffered while he was in high school his first year as the kicker and his percentage is best in Georgia Tech history in a single season among kickers with a minimum of 10 attempts. With the two field goals tonight, he's 13 out of 14. That record was actually set last year by Gavin Stewart, who went 12 out of 13 to set the single season field goal percentage record for Georgia Tech, 92.3. And he was the kicker at the start of this year, but he went 0 for 3 at the beginning of the year, paved the way for Burr, and he's the man. As long as 48 against Wake Forest, and that is his longest attempt. David Shanahan, the putter, is the holder. Henry Freer, the snapper, from 49, no good. I think if you keep having to kick field goals, you're not going to hang in there with Kirby Smart's team. Here's Molly. Coach, the quarterback run game hurt you guys at times, but what did your defense do well in that final drive? Well, we played good red area defense a couple times. We gave up a third and nine in the red area, and we had a big stop there before the half. You can't let them get started like that. How did your offense find some success despite missing some key skill players? Well, they really hadn't been stopped. They had a turnover, and we got to avoid that. All right, thank you, Coach. No Lad McConkey and no Brock Bowers with 236 yards of offense in the half for Georgia. They lead by eight. We'll send you to the studio for the Capital One halftime report after this message in order meeting 21 to 13 as we get ready for the second half. Welcome back to Atlanta. Sean McDonough along with Greg McElroy. No Brock Bowers tonight. No Lad McConkey. Two of their best weapons in the case of Bowers, their best weapon as a receiver. So uh, as the half went along, especially the ground game really took over for Georgia. Yeah, that's the key and it's been really, really difficult for Georgia Tech to get anything going with their run defense. I mean, they came in one of the worst in college football against the run, and Georgia's taking advantage of that right now. 114 rushing yards there in the first half, nearly seven yards per carry. The Yellow Jack has got to find an answer against the one-two punch. <laughs> and it's Makai Muse taking the opening kickoff. And another good return. He had a 34-yard kickoff return in the first half. This one's 37. Let's take a look at tonight's Mark of a Fighter moment brought to you by Modelo. It's those running backs, the one-two punch. Milton being back has been huge for the Georgia offense. A little bit of movement up front. He dices it right behind the pullers, and then he surges forward into the end zone a few plays later. And then Edwards got his chance. A little counteraction to the outside. It's well blocked. Especially by the tight end Delp, who leads the way, and then he finishes on off a couple plays later as he stretches to the end zone and finds pay dirt. It's really been a great first half for the offensive line of the Bulldogs. Playing without Tate Ratledge, their starting right guard. Edwards dropped for a loss by Paul Moala. The linebacker played last year at Idaho, one year there after a couple of years at Notre Dame. He tore both Achilles in less than a year when he was at Notre Dame. That was a great play, and that's what Georgia Tech has to do defensively. They have to be more aggressive at the second level because they were kind of cautious there in the first half, and they were engaging in contact with the running backs and getting mowed over. So they have to be more aggressive and try to shoot the gap. Loss of a yard. Carson Beck, 8 out of 11 passing. Steps into the pocket and fires a rocket. That bounces around and it's incomplete. Trying to get it to Dylan Bell. Nearly intercepted off the deflection, too. As it bounces right back inside. Nearly it picked off. Georgia didn't have many third downs in the first half. They're three out of three. Improving on their season 
57 percent percentage that led the country coming in. Four receivers, three to the left. And on third down and 11, lots of time for Beck. Going deep for Bell, and he has it. Inbounds, it's a catch. The officials conferring, and they're going to mark it at the 24-yard line of Georgia Tech. 39 yards. Amazing throw by Carson Beck. And how about the concentration from Bell? Looks like that right foot gets down as he secures the catch. Let's take a look right there. Does he have, no, he control? have control? Of it. Ball still moving a little bit there as that right foot goes down. Georgia tried to go quickly to the line to snap it before a replay review. They'll take a look at it in the replay booth. And we'll be back in Atlanta in a moment. The receiver bobbled the ball. The pass is incomplete. Here's another look at it, and it really isn't until just now that it looked like Bell had it. Matt Austin, what do you think? I agree with the call. I think he is bobbling the ball throughout his fingers. He gets firm control, but he's already out of bounds, so I think that's a good overturn to incomplete. A great play by Rodney Shelley, the corner in coverage, just playing it all the way through the end and getting that arm in there to try to dislodge the ball a little bit further. That was an excellent job by the corner. So Brett Larson off for the first Georgia punt of the night. One of the many remarkable things about this Georgia team, they have not had a punt returned against them this year. He's punted 26 times. They've all been fair catches, rolled dead, gone out of bounds. Not a single punt return. And part of it is the great work of the Gunners. Dominic Blaylock, the former Georgia Bulldog, back deep. Marion Smith and Dominic Lovett do a fantastic job running down quickly. And there still won't be a punt return against Georgia. Fair catch by Blaylock. Here's Molly McGrath. Well, Sean, Georgia Tech head coach Brent Key said they kept Georgia's defense on their heels by mixing it up with the run in the pass. And he stressed that the quarterback run game is going to be crucial in this second half. So they'll continue to ask Haynes King to run with it. And Key was emotional and fired up coming out of the locker room saying, we have 30 minutes. We've been down by more than this and come back before to win games that no one thought that we'd win. We're not afraid. We have what it takes to win this game, guys. Yeah, they've had an up and down season in that regard. They've blown some leads. And of course, they had the miracle of miracles in their win at Miami. And all Miami had to do was take a knee and win the game. They ran a play and fumbled, and Georgia Tech went the length of the field in the final minute. They went 74 yards, scored with one second left to win. Jamal Haynes, the ball carrier. He got to the 27. Five yards on the run. Dante Smith upended but gets the first down. Javon Bullard, the outstanding safety, sent Smith into the air. It's a pickup of seven. Georgia Tech picking up right where they left off in the first half. Really been efficient running it outside the tackles against the Georgia defense. They're going to continue to attack that. I'm surprised so far that the leverage of those defensive ends is still head up to the outside man. You'd think they'd widen a bit so that they could take away some of those outside runs. Dante Smith. Has another first down with an 11 yard gain. Blocked there on the edge by Luke Benson, the tight end. Ask him to do a lot there in the run game. He doesn't get a lot of passes, but he can be very effective. It's kind of that fullback H back for Buster Faulkner's offense. Dave Smith up to 55 yards rushing on nine carries. Here he comes for very little. Well played by Raylan Wilson, true freshman from Tallahassee. Haynes King, highly recruited out of high school. 
Went to Texas A&M. He was kind of in and out of the starting lineup over three years. Also battled some injuries. He said he and his dad had decided he would never transfer from a school unless the entire coaching staff got fired or unless he graduated and could be a grad transfer. Over the middle, off the hands of Luke Benson and almost picked off by Javon Bullard. Gotta give credit to Haynes King, too, just persevering through the adversity at AM and really coming out the other side as a great player. Well, he decided to graduate in three years so that he could transfer. Got his degree from AM. He had a relationship with Chris Winky. From his recruiting time, there's another ball through the hands of his receiver. That one for Chase Lane, a wide receiver with just seven catches all year. Chris Wanky was at Tennessee and tried to recruit King there. So he made the contact with Haynes King when he went in the portal. And he said he very quickly came to like what he heard about what Brent Key had in mind for this program. He said he'd never really been in a big city like Atlanta. And it's worked out very well for all concerned. David Shanahan to punt. Kai Muse back for it. Ball start. Off this from 27. Roger Kennedy. Still fourth down. Sidelines returning kickoffs. He's fortunate that one was close to the boundary. You're watching Rivalry Week. Bam folder, I guess. I don't know. Kevin sent me the email. I should have sent one back. That's, that's on me. It's great to you just smile looking at all these people. It is a wonderful group produced by Phil Dean, also not pictured, and Scott Johnson. You never saw a Camry didn't love. Here's Kendall Milton, 86 yards rushing in the first half, his most in the first half of his career. He got 10 there. He has a chance for a career night. His career high is 127 earlier this year, just a couple of weeks ago against Ole Miss in that big win against the top 10 ranked Rebels. After a wild start, the game has settled in a little bit. Here's Milton with lots of blockers out in front. And that'll get him over 100. Or he's finally whistled or stopped forward progress at his own 43. And a great job by Ernest Green and Oscar Delp out there. They pull around a little pin and pull technique. Milton gets upfield. As you can see, it's so hard to bring him down when he's at full speed. 220 pounds, but man, he's a load and can really finish runs. So they quickly get out of their worst starting field position of the night. This one started at their own 14. They've gone 29 yards and two runs by Milton. Quiet night for Beck. They've not asked him to throw it much. Eight out of 13, Milton again. And why would you throw it when he can get you nine and a half per carry? Kenan Johnson made the tackle. Well, and the defensive coordinator, Kevin Schur, clearly recognizing that they got to get more aggressive because they've been gashed over and over again. That time he calls internal blitz. Milton bounces it to the outside. And there's plenty of space for him to find another nice gain on the ground. Well, that's a career high 132 on just 13 carries. Eclipsing by five the previous career high he put up two weeks ago. They were ready for him that time. Stopped and driven back by the middle of that defense. Daquan Douse, Cornelius Tatum. One 
yard loss on the play. It's second down. On Dallas is not very big, but he's very quick. So he's going to have to win against a massive offensive line with quickness. That time slides inside and they make initial contact behind the line of scrimmage for really the first time all night, it feels like. Second and 11. Neither team has had a two score lead tonight. This eight point advantage for Georgia, the largest for either side. Back over the middle, caught. Dominic Lovett, first down inside the 30 with Jalen King, the outstanding sixth year safety right there for Georgia Tech. And tremendous timing from Carson Beck. Lovett breaks across. Pretty well defended there by King. He arrives just on time, but the throw is perfect. Right in the Lovett's midsection. He can body up that receiver, shield him from the defender, and there was a nice pitch and catch. Four catches for 60 yards for Lovett. Marion Smith, a rare touch. He can move. He's been a spreader on the track team. They'd like to get him the ball more often. He's had trouble being a consistent catcher of the football. That's a 12-yard game. But he puts fear in the defense every time he's on the field. All you got to do is watch the game against Ohio State in the semifinal last year. Incredible top-end speed. Inconsistent with his hands. That's why he hasn't really been a factor in the passing game. But Mike Bobo acknowledges they have to get him more involved because he could be a big play threat when the competition intensifies. Congratulations to Mike Bobo on the semifinals for the Broyles Award to the top assistant coach in the country. Well deserved. Dejan Edwards. Bobo's already had a good weekend. His son Jake was in the state high school football playoffs here in Georgia last night for Prince Avenue Christian. They had a 41 to 7 win over Irwin County. Looks like Greg Vandegrift, whose son Brock is a backup quarterback at Georgia. Mike Bobo, one of our favorite people to talk to. Last night when he came into the meeting, he's like, okay, we got to go because I got to go watch my son's football game. He was walking out whether we were done or not at 7.30 on the dot. Good for him and his son. Second and 11. And dropped for a loss. Edwards by Micaiah Scott, the transfer from South Carolina. Loss of three. Big play there by Micaiah Scott. Only really one of the few times George has been behind the sticks tonight. Usually in this part of the field, third down, you're looking in the direction of Brock Bowers, but with him being unavailable, probably going to try to work Dylan Bell, who's down at the bottom of the screen. He's their most versatile weapon. See if they get a one on one situation with him. That might be the direction they're looking. Five receivers, three to Carson Beck's left. It's a quick throw to the left through the hands of Makai Muse. Finally whistled incomplete. Players are scrambling for the ball. So Kirby Smart sends the field goal team on to try to get the first two score lead of the night for either side. And the ball's maybe just a touch high, but one that you would anticipate Muse being able to reel in. They get third and long situation. They run the tunnel screen, and it's been very effective, but that time it never got started. So there's Peyton Woodring, the true freshman from Lafayette, Louisiana, who has made 15 in a row. He's 19 out of 22. This is from 39. Carson Beck is the holder. You don't see that very often, the starting quarterback as the holder around college football. Kirby Smart says the field goal kicker picks the holder. And Beck's doing a very nice. The ACC Network getting fans prepped for the ACC championship between Louisville and Florida State starting Friday with ACC Huddle at 3, followed by ACC PM. Saturday, the ACC Huddle is back at 6. Then for the championship game between the Cardinals and the Seminoles at 8, a special command center coverage bringing a unique view of the game. In other words, just you know, put on the ACC network and watch on Friday and Saturday because they have a lot of really good stuff going on. It's also on the app. 
touchback, and Georgia Tech will start at the 25. Georgia Tech's really been, done a great job running the football all night long, and here in the second half, still utilizing some misdirection, little stretch zone with the tight end blocking backside. They knife it up inside for a nice game. Then they go with a little bit of a sweep with the lead. Benson out in front, handling Tyke Smith at the end of the line. Smith gets around him. They've really been able to mix it up well with both backs tonight, but we haven't seen a whole lot of Haynes King after the first quarter running the football. That needs to become the next step in the evolution here in the second half well, of the run game. so effective early on. He had four carries in the first quarter, including the touchdown. He hasn't had a rush since nine and a half minutes remain in the second quarter. He was credited with one rush on a sack. It wasn't a running play. Eight yard gain there for Jamal Haynes. I think that they are giving them the give read where he hands it to the running back, but at some point they go back to the quarterback power downhill. Yeah, I mean, they're, I guess they're content, as you said, they're making some progress with this, although they haven't scored a point here in the uh, third quarter and have scored only three since the first quarter. So they're putting up some yardage, but you need to score. And at the end of the run here, Jamal Haynes wanting a face mask and it did look like the defender grabbed the face mask with his left hand that was Christian Miller and might have gotten away with one there down to 420 to go in the third quarter play action pass into traffic trying to get it to Dominic Blaylock well covered by Kamari Lassiter about whom Kirby Smart was raving last night. That he's one of the best that they've had there. The junior from Savannah. He's terrific and is the primary cover guy this year. He's given up just 10 completions. So if you can get one in the tight coverage that he provides, keep the ball because it doesn't happen very often. Here's a keeper by Haynes King and He's driven back by Tyrion Ingram Dawkins and driven back apparently a little too much. Initially, but here at the end, he shoves Haynes King right there, and that's what drew the flag. It's just completely unnecessary. He's totally bottled up, but as he pushes him, it's right in front of the center judge. And the reaction on the Georgia sideline tells you all you need to know. And Kirby Smart talking to his player calmly, just saying, Hey, man, end it just a little sooner, and they would be off the field. Fourth Georgia penalty. King over his last five passing. Deep down the sidelines and incomplete. He had Jamal Haynes open for the linebacker in coverage, C.J. Allen. And you can see Haynes saying, you need to throw that ball a little bit deeper. There's been a great adjustment by Haynes. The ball is slightly underthrown, but really more to the outside. He was a receiver prior to making the move in the offseason to running back, so he does have great ability on the outside to create mismatches against linebackers but that time just a little bit off the mark leads to the incompletion second and ten so King over his last six after a seven out of eight start Dante Smith stood up on the corner by smile Munden and Malachi Starks a gain of three I know they've been relatively conservative as it approaches the fourth down plan tonight, but two possession games, still plenty of time. But I think at this point, you got to kind of flip into hyper aggressive. So, probably two downs to get it here, depending on what happens on this third down play. Two out of nine on third down. Another area where they're much improved this year is on third down. That one is incomplete. The general direction of Eric Singleton. And 
And the offense is going to stay out there for fourth down and seven. And this is just a big miss by King. They motion over, nobody goes with him. He's wide open in the flat. Nobody covers him. Instead, he works left, and it's incomplete. Fourth down, a wobbler down the middle. Incomplete. There is a flag. Intended for Scyther. Smile Munden in coverage. It looked like the ball might have been tipped. That's why it wobbled, and that's what Kirby Smart saying. Either that or he just threw a really ugly pass. Ball was definitely wobbling significantly, and it looked like Zion Loeb applying the pressure right up the middle might have gotten a hand on it. It looks like he did, so in the event in which it's tipped, then it would not be pass interference. So this might be one they need to take a look at. And here comes the whistle, just as Georgia Tech was about to snap it if they were... A little quicker to snap it. They might have gotten away with it. The players under review to determine if the ball was tipped. And it clearly was. I mean, they were lined up, snapped the ball. <laughs> Zion Logue knows he got a piece of it. The senior from Lebanon, Tennessee. It's hard to tell there. This will be a great angle of it right here. And it looks like that right thumb, as the ball goes right by, the right thumb is what ultimately draws the contact with the football. No question. It's a great effort there by Logue. So, Tim Hedgepeth, the referee, over talking to Rusty Acre, the replay official. But, and I think Brent Key's expression says it all. He knows this is going to be overturned. And they'll turn it over on downs. Brent Key was an assistant last year to Jeff Collins. Collins let go early in the season after a one and three start. Key, the interim coach. They went four and four. And now they're six and five this year. Collins in three plus seasons won 10 games. They went 10 and 28 before he took over as the head coach, and they've gone 10 and 9 under Key. That is significant and quick improvement. Yeah, and they've done a good job of adding some key pieces too. It's a freshman. The, the, review, the ball was tipped. Therefore, there is no foul the pass No doubt that Brent Key is doing a great job, but an unfortunate turn there after they thought they had a fresh set. Great play by Lowe, though, to get off the field. They did look around the reports that Willie Fritz was offered the job last year, but he wanted to stay with Tulane through the bowl game. Key, a popular choice among the alumni, and getting more popular with the success that they're having in his first full year. Here's Dylan Bell with a lot of blockers and not many white shirts. Gets away from an attempted tackle around the head and gets down to the 26-yard line. Georgia Tech's really been selling out up the middle. So this time Mike Bobo tries to go with a little fake up the middle, handed on the end around, and Dylan Bell, a guy that's played running back and wide receiver all season long. Says his favorite player is Debo Samuel and showing off some of that open field moves like Debo Samuel used all the time with the San Francisco 49ers. Versatile threat is Dylan Bell. Milton ahead. Bell caught a touchdown pass last week against Tennessee, threw a touchdown pass. And Mike Bobo, creative play caller, play designer, finding a lot of ways to use him. Under two minutes to go, third quarter. That one caught 
And fighting for the first down is Bell. Great effort by the sophomore from Houston. Another example of the timing from Carson Beck, too. I mean, this ball is thrown immediately, just slightly inside. It's not bad coverage there by Amari Harvey, but Bell is so strong after the catch and refuses to go down, driving for a couple extra yards. They're just joining us, Georgia, trying to win its 29th straight game, which would set the SEC record all by themselves. Alabama won 28 in a row twice. Once under Bear Bryant, once under Gene Stallings. Swing pass to Dominic Lovett inside the five, and near another first down at the three. Mike Bobo really has Georgia Tech on their heels now. I mean, the last couple drives, Georgia Tech really made an emphasis to try to stop the downhill rushing attack. So now the options have been, hey, fake it inside, throw it to the perimeter. Fake it inside, hand it on an end around. You're going to sell out between the tackles. We'll beat you on the outside. And they've made that adjustment nicely on this drive. And all the little things they do well, too. Using the clock with the lead. Now they run quickly over the ball, trying to catch the Jackets off guard. And perhaps they did. As Milton, with very little resistance, as he scores a touchdown. See the muddle huddle messed with Georgia Tech's alignment. At the last minute, looked like Moala would come to the outside and kind of play the defensive end spot working against Ernest Green. And if you have a middle linebacker working against the left tackle in full run support, that's bad ball. If you're a defensive coordinator, easy matchup won by the offensive line, and Milton walks into the end zone for his second score of the game. There's an injured Georgia Tech player. Clayton Powell Lee. So Georgia goes 55 yards in five plays. Milton's second touchdown of the night. And 139 rushing yards adding to his career high. Here's Kevin Nagandi. Sean, time now for our Chick-fil-A move on the field. There's a snow globe game in Manhattan, Kansas. Iowa State taking the lead here. Rocco back to Jalen Null. 79 yards. Stay on your feet. He does. 21-20. Cyclones with the lead. Back to you, Greg and Molly. All right, Kevin, thank you. Well, 16 rushes, also a career high for Milton. All of them career highs. Yards and touchdowns. You just got the sense it would be his kind of night, too. When you just look at some of the bodies that are on the Georgia Tech defense, they have some athleticism, they have some quickness, but they don't have a lot of size. So anytime you can get a big running back, it's going to be very difficult to bring him down with undersized defenders. We'll be back in just a moment. So when this group's at 100%, they're insanely difficult to stop. And even when they're less than 100%, they still have great depth and skill positions to step up in those great players' absence. So Jared Zirkel will kick off. 17 straight points for Georgia. They trail 10 to 7 after the first quarter. No panic. They've been here many times. They're 9 and 0 over the last four seasons when trailing after the first quarter, including 3 and 0 prior to tonight this season. Well, it's a rivalry game. I mentioned a lot of these coaches involved as players as well, including Mike Bobo. One of the most memorable sequences in this rivalry. He thought he had thrown an interception in 1997. It was picked off, but Traveris Tillman called for pass interference. So Bobo got another chance. He hit Corey Allen for an eight-yard touchdown with eight seconds left. There's the two of them, Traveris Tillman, who's on the Georgia Tech staff. Georgia won a 27-24. We saw Kirby Smart celebrating the victory with Bobo. They were teammates back there in 1997. Brent Key was an offensive lineman on that Georgia Tech team. 
Can't even imagine what that conversation would be like. Do you think still to this day Tillman tries to defend that it wasn't pass interference, or you think he's accepted the penalty at this point? Uh, uh, I think that's one of those things you never let go. <laughs> I didn't grab him. Mike Bobo said he thought he had blown the game and was very happy to see the flag. <laughs> that is the end of the third quarter. Ten unanswered points in the quarter for Georgia. Seemingly on their way to win number 29 in a row. Back with more. Coach, what will it take to hold on to this lead and put this game away in the fourth quarter? Stops and good offense. I mean, we had done a great job containing our quarterback. He's playing really well, but we have gotten some key stops. All right, thank you, Coach. Thank you. Yeah, they have. They've only given up one touchdown tonight, and that was the opening score of the game on a short field when they turned it over, and Georgia Tech only had to go 37 yards for the touchdown. Jackets have had only two field goals since. Have not scored since the second quarter. Here's Singleton. Eric Singleton! Malachi Starks trying to run him down. Out of bounds, just shy of the 10-yard line. Just a great job on the outside, too, by Dylan Leonard and Luke Benson. The two tight ends, they go out. And it gave you two of the defenders, Bowler to Tyke Smith, and Singleton's out the gate. Scored that as a pass play for 57. And that run dropped by Tyke Smith. Their leading tackler for the year, he dropped Dante Smith for a loss of a yard. He's been absolutely outstanding all season long. I mean, played at a crazy high level just about every week. Two games that he wasn't, but he was still great in those ones, too. Tyke Smith, their star defender, one of many great ones for the Georgia Bulldogs. Leading tackler, their team leader in tackles for a loss, now with seven and a half for the year. And that's as a member of their secondary. Dante Smith. Are you surprised they've totally gone away from Haynes King on design running plays? I am, especially this part of the field. I mean, at this part of the field, when the field gets condensed, quarterback run is your friend. I mean, at this point, unless you're really trying to work perimeter run game still like they've had success with, I don't understand why they would just want to just hammer it up inside with their backs. I mean, Haynes King with the misdirection stuff has been very difficult to defend tonight and really all throughout the season. Two out of ten on third down. Here comes some late pressure. King lost the ball. Marvin Jones Jr. got there. And the Jackets got it back. The way back at the 23-yard line. Corey Robinson, the tackle, recovered it. And it was a great green dog pressure by the freshman Raylan Wilson. He recognizes that the offensive line had all engaged. He decides to go. He attacks King, forces him out of the pocket. And then as he escapes, there's really nowhere else to go as he tries to turn back inside. And Marvin Jones dislodges the football. His first sack of the season. So here's Aiden Burr. Two out of three tonight. This one a 40-yard attempt. And it's good. And that does get them back within two scores. Down by 15 with 12-13 to go in Atlanta. Kirby Smart, Georgia going for their 29th straight win. That would be the SEC record all by themselves. We mentioned a moment ago Alabama won 28 in a row twice. It would be their 21st consecutive non-conference win. They're 15th straight on the road. They're 14 wins in a row is the longest active streak in FBS football and road wins. Second longest in SEC history, Alabama. 21 road wins in a row back in the early and mid-70s. They've won 38 straight regular season games. A short kickoff goes to Dylan Bell. And Kyle Eifert stopped him, but not until he crossed midfield and then some. We're just had a few great returns tonight in their kick return department, man. I mean, Bell had one, Hughes had one earlier. They've been real close to breaking one. And 
That's massive when you're on the road in a rivalry game. The team that you're playing just scores, flip momentum back by creating a big return and good field position for your offense. And it's had three kickoff returns of more than 30 yards tonight. We saw it on the bottom of the graphic. George has won a school record 38 straight regular season games. They're 44 and one of the last 45 in all games. The only loss was to Alabama in the SEC title game here in Atlanta, December 4th of 2021. Dejan Edwards, the ball carrier, Micaiah Scott, the tackle. I think what's most remarkable, too, I mean, it's almost rare when they're even in a super competitive game. I mean, they are playing to a standard that nobody else in college football has matched in the last few years. They won this season by an average of 25 points per game on their way to the 11 0 start. Georgia and Oregon, the only two teams in the country in the top 10 in both scoring offense and scoring defense. Beck throws on the run, caught Arian Smith. Nice night for him, perhaps build his confidence to get him a little more involved going forward. An 11 yard gain. Massive to get him going a little bit. Just He's the guy that every single defensive coordinator has to be mindful of with the deep ball. And it could open up, if he can clear some things out, it'll open up everybody underneath if that threat exists. Eleven minutes to go. Edwards, nice cut back to his left. First down. Fifteen yards for Edwards. A really good job cutting back here, too, by Edwards. Just inside split zone. Delt does a good job at the end man of the line of scrimmage. Edwards cuts back, and there's a big gain again for the Georgia running back. And like Bobo said, they've worked hard with Delp on being a more effective blocker, and he is. Love it, the motion man. There's Delp. Good tackle. Jalen King made the tackle. There is a flag on the play in the middle of the line of scrimmage right between the hash marks. Holding offense number 53. Dylan Fairchild, the left guard. Looks like Georgia Tech is trying to cross face and bring pressure off the left hand side. The ball was out really quick. But it looked like Fairchild might have had his arm up and around, but man, for holding call to happen that quickly, you don't see it happen that quickly very often. Edwards with running room outside and tackled from behind by Kevin Harris, a transfer from Alabama. A four-yard gain for Edwards. He's up to 45 yards rushing now. Milton has 139. As a team, they've rushed for 219. Those two guys really complement each other well. Milton really more the downhill guy. Edwards very patient, decisive, with great acceleration when the hole opens. Kendall Milton back in at running back now. Beck single coverage. Caught. Dylan Bell won the battle. There's a flag down near the 10 yard line. Rodney Shelley had the coverage. And now he's going to the downfield. Offense number 63. Center Cedric Van Pran made his 42nd consecutive start for Georgia tonight. We need to see Van Pran kind of meander his way downfield. Now he has to be three yards downfield or more for it to be an ineligible downfield when the ball re is released from Carson Beck's hand. It looked like it was really close. And Kirby Smart justifiably a little frustrated because it did not look like Van Pran had gotten that far downfield when the ball came out of Beck's hand. 
And that's one of those when you go back and look at tapes you could call a lot more often than it is called. So they're back to second down and 20. Blitz off the corner. Back pressure. Takes off running. Carson back. Looking like his idol when he grew up in Jacksonville. Tim Tebow. 15 yard run for number 15. And that's one part of his game that I don't think gets enough respect. He's not a blazing speed guy, but he's a pretty good runner, and he's big and physical and can break through arm tackles. So he can definitely get out and create some problems for you if you are overly aggressive in your pass rush. Very good athlete. He was a talented pitcher in high school. In fact, as a freshman in high school, he committed to the University of Florida baseball program. Given all kinds of time into the end zone, and it is intercepted. KJ Wallace came away with it after a ricochet off Jalen King. Did a number of those balls pinball around tonight. So looked like they were going to score a couple of times. Penalties stopped them, and now the turnover. First interception thrown by Beck. Some interesting views from the progressive pylon camera. The camera can take a hit. So it looked like Georgia was about to put this away, go back to a three score lead. The K.J. Wallace, the interception, his first of the season, second year here as a transfer from Notre Dame. Malik Rutherford bounces off a tackle and gets enough extra yardage for a first down. Now they want a flag on Marvin Jones Jr. on the sideline. But there is not a flag thrown. Looks like at that point, was a little bit of a grab there by Marvin Jones who kind of threw him to the ground a little bit he was clearly outside right there I mean I'm surprised right in front of Brett Key too I'm shocked they didn't call the foul there this tackle by Allen allowed the first down here's Malik Rutherford well, they can go down and score a touchdown here. It's going to get much more interesting in a hurry. That's a 13-yard completion of the redshirt sophomore from Miami. And he's down and grabbing at the back of his right leg. He's their second leading receiver on the team for the season. He has two tonight. Did they knock off Florida? Back to you, Sean. All right, thank you, Kevin. Former Alabama quarterback, not far from me, watched the end of that game with great interest. <laughs> you surprised they didn't rush more people? <laughs> Auburn. I was really surprised on fourth and 31 to play that passively. It was a great throw and a great catch, and my reaction was not understated. Uh, no, it was not. <laughs> I mean, Alabama that close to being out of the college football playoff picture. Here's Jamal Haynes. They'll mark him down to the 24. And Georgia Tech trying to get back within a touchdown. That's a 23-yard run. And a terrific run on the counter. The GT counter, both the guard and the tackle pull around. Haynes sets up the blocker and bursts to the outside. Excellent run there by Haynes. This is timeout for an injury. It's Javon Bullard who's going off gingerly. He was in on the tackle. On Sunday, December 3rd, we'll have the exclusive reveal of the college football playoff selection. Brees Davis and the guys break down the final rankings from top to bottom. Coaches, reactions, and a live interview with the committee chairman, Boo Corrigan. That's at noon on ESPN and the app Sunday, December 3rd. Of course, that'll be one day after the conference championship games have concluded Jamal Haynes on first and ten 
Von Bullard went off. Dan Jackson came in for him and experienced backup. Zion Logue made the tackle and Bullard wasn't out for long. Here he comes right back in. That's a relief for Georgia fans. Probably their best player on defense has been Bullard throughout the course of the year. Him and Tyke Smith, it'd be a photo finish between the two. So massive to have him at full health moving into next week's game. Against Alabama. George will be right back here in Atlanta. Here's Haynes taken out of bounds by C.J. Allen. And the clock running. Georgia Tech might want to think about speeding up the operation here a little bit. They're all still looking over to the sideline. Some sort of play call. Must get a touchdown here. Another field goal doesn't really do them any good with five and a half to go. Dante Smith. Trying to break free from Raylan Wilson. Got very close to the first down. And this is pretty much the ball game here for Brent Key. Need a fourth down conversion. Down by two touchdowns. They've gotten stoned up the middle, too, on short yard situations. Maybe try something to the edge where Georgia's had a little bit lesser time slopping, stopping them. Dante Smith. Not enough before he was driven back. First down, Georgia Tech. But the clock continues to run for 45. Zach Pyron, the backup quarterback, has come onto the field. And Haynes King is out there, too. As a matter of fact, King is the one wide to the left. So here's Pyron, a redshirt freshman. Looked like it was a design run, then it looked like he was going to throw, and he squirts down the sideline. Looked like a lot of things. It looked like it was going to wind up being nothing, and all of a sudden he got eight. It's a great run by Pyron. It looked like for a moment Raylan Wilson, who was coming over the top at linebacker, was going to drop him for a short gain, but he somehow gets through it, finds some open space. You know what we have to look at this from the progressive Pyron camera. <laughs> well done. Well, we were hoping all day he did it. <laughs> <laughs> and how lucky are we? It was near the goal line. Haynes King, another touchdown! His second rushing touchdown of the game. They'll go for one and try to make it an eight-point game. Just a great job. They fake a little speed option pitch to the outside. They have counter action inside Fusel and Scyther get great blocks on the edge, and King walks into the end zone for the second time. They go 80 yards in 10 plays. It did take them 438. The extra point is good by Aiden Byrne. So he has passed for 158. He's rushed for two touchdowns. And it's a one-score game. They have a chance. Tuesday will bring you two featured men's college basketball matchups from the ACC-SEC Challenge. 7.30, number 10 Miami, number 16 Kentucky. 30 Clemson against 17th ranked Alabama. That's on ESPN Tuesday night. ACC, SEC, just as this is. On a cold Saturday night in the capital of Georgia. The Yellow Jackets trying to end a five game losing streak in this. Battle for the unofficial state championship. Meanwhile, Georgia trying to get its 29th straight win. to be the longest streak in SEC history all by themselves. Georgia Tech trying to beat number one for the third time in school history. They're 2-12-1 all-time against number ones. 
The last win was way back in 1990 when they won at number one Virginia by three, and that was big. Georgia Tech went on to win the national championship, split national championship with Colorado. They won the coaches' poll, finished 11 0 1. Onside kick handled well. I, yes, you have no faith in your run defense to stop Georgia because it's a one score game and you have all three of your timeouts, but you've only made them punt once all night. Exactly, and they've also had a very difficult time on kick coverage tonight, too. There are three different kick returns that have gone for 30 plus yards, so Brent Key decides to roll the dice with the onside kick. I think it's probably the right move, too, knowing how much his defense has struggled throughout the course of this game stopping the run. At Georgia's run for 235. As we said, they've made Georgia punt only once all night. Here's Edwards. Ahead. And no timeout for the moment. Four yard gain. The 23 points allowed by the Georgia defense the most this year. They hadn't given up more than 21 in a game. UAB scored 21. Missouri scored 21. Georgia Tech, 23 tonight. Second and six. The dogs in no hurry. Carson Beck goes under center with Edwards, the running back. Play fake. He sidesteps the rush and slides down short of the first down. They'll mark it back at the 41, comfortably short by about three yards. It was Braylon Oliver who brought the quick pressure that forced Beck to change what he had in mind. And I think Kirby's saying he slid three yards short of the first down. Looked like that slide was initiated around the 40 yard line. He's stopped all the way back at around the 42. So here's Beck as he escapes. As soon as you start into it, I think they got the spot right. So it's third down and three. With 2.52 to go, Tech has used one of its timeouts, two remaining. We mentioned Carson Beck, freshman in high school commits to Florida to play baseball. So how did you change your mind? He said, well, I had a really good football season. Then a bunch of football schools came after me. Alabama the next year said, you can play football and basketball, I mean, excuse me, football and baseball here on a full football scholarship. He said, well, the full ride's better than the not full ride I was gonna get from Florida. Then he kept getting better in high school football. Many other schools came after him in recruiting and he decided to come to Georgia instead. Oh, for their last three on third down. Edwards chugging for the first down. They had a chance to stop him near the line of scrimmage and couldn't tackle him. Kevin Shears' defense desperately needed a stop. It looked like they might get it. Kyle Eifert. He ran through unblocked. Chance to tackle Edwards in the backfield. Edwards slides inside and surges forward. For the conversion, just a bad missed tackle there from Eford, who's been excellent the last couple weeks, but a big opportunity there missed for the Ramblin' Wreck. Fresh set of downs, two timeouts for Georgia Tech. As we approach two minutes to go. Milton. And another timeout called by Brent Key. Juan Douse made the tackle for the Yellow Jackets. Friday night at 8 on ABC, the Pac-12 championship game presented by Dr. Pepper from Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas. Number six, Oregon. Number four, Washington. First time they've ever met in a conference championship game. What a season Bo Nix is having. 3,906 passing yards leads the country. And a completion percentage of just over 78%. And it's not like it's dink and dunk if you watch the game last 
last night. And who do you like among uh, these three, or is somebody else be your leading Heisman contender right now? I think it's down to three at this point. I mean, Bo Nix, I thought that was his best performance of the year last night. So much of what they've done have been quick throws, yards after catch, but last night he showed against a really good Oregon State defense, the ability to push the ball down the field a little more, make some plays on the move, improvise. Last night was sensational, but man, it's hard to overlook what Jaden Daniels has done, even though he's on the three-loss team. Winner of that one would have a great shot to be in the college football playoff. Here's Kendall Milton. What a night for Milton. Dragging jackets with him. Improving on his career high. And that should just about do it. Another first down, only one timeout left. And reality setting in among the Georgia Tech fans. This will be six straight losses. That's overall. They haven't won since 2016, Kirby Smart's first year in Athens. There is an injured Yellow Jacket, it's Brooks. And this will be 12 straight wins for Georgia here in Atlanta, back to 1999. But when you're here, you can kind of understand why it happens. It's a home game for them. They have, they have many more fans here than Georgia Tech in Georgia Tech's home stadium. Yeah, I mean, it's been packed. I uh, know even throughout the town. I mean, there's nothing but red and black folks barking occasionally uh, as you walk <laughs> by them. But it's really remarkable how this team has performed all year long. And adverse situations. I mean, they got punched in the mouth a couple times tonight, and they continue to bounce back. They made a couple of big mistakes that led to points for Georgia Tech, and yet when they have to have a play with the game on the line, they always seem to find a way. So, assuming this goes in the win column, as it almost certainly will, how do you size up Georgia and Alabama in the SEC championship game. That's probably a winner gets into the college football playoff. I think most people would think it, it would be a scenario where the winner would get in, but man, Texas is the roadblock, so I think it's very dependent on what happens with the Longhorns, and I think Georgia wins. Obviously, they take care of business there. Yeah, Georgia goes on the obviously saying, they're in, but, Alabama's out. Yeah, but, but were Alabama to win, that could make for some very interesting <laughs> scenarios, including one where maybe Georgia doesn't get in. Right, and I think that would be wild, too, considering a team will have won 29, the last 30 would be left out, but it's only about this year, and just so happens the field competing for those four playoff spots are about as deep as it's been in quite some time. We're going to go into the victory formation. Georgia Tech can stop it once if it wants to. And it wants to, Brent Key. So no timeouts left. And barring the kind of mistake that Miami made against Georgia Tech, it's going to be a win for Kirby Smart. And another perfect regular season, 12 and 0, undefeated in the regular season for the third season in a row. It's crazy. And this team, we've mentioned resilient, and that's what Kirby Smart has, has discussed. I mean, this team is resilient. They are excellent. They've dealt with a lot of injuries. I mean, guys in and out of the lineup, lack of continuity. Some guys. Banged up in fall camp, only now starting to play their best football, like Michael Williams. But man, here at the time of the year, you want to be playing your best. They're certainly rounding into form. They're the first SEC school to go eight and zero in conference play in three straight seasons. <laughs> and if they were to beat Alabama next week, they'd join Florida, 1995 and 96, as the only SEC schools to go. 8 and 0 and win the SEC championship game in consecutive years. It's remarkable what they've built and with some of the young players that are already contributing on both sides of the ball. It'd be tough to envision them dropping off anytime soon. So that's it. Valiant effort by the Yellow Jackets comes up short. And Georgia has won 29 straight games now all alone with the longest winning streak in Southeastern Conference history. They've won 15 straight road games, extending the longest active streak in the country and the second longest in conference.